Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. We're talking movies today, D'Anthony. Movies. Movies. <coughs> movies. Uh, coming up in uh, a little bit, we got a call in with uh, the writer from the movie The Midway. Mm. West Tilt. Yes, it was. Tooth, uh, tooth, like, whew, dude. That was a big budget movie. Yeah, it was a hundred million they spent on that. Hundred million it was dollars. Independent. I think that's the second most anyone's ever spent on an independent movie. The biggest was Cloud Atlas, which I don't recommend watching unless you're on a lot of drugs. Did you see it? No, I did not. But um, I, I mean, I saw. I've seen clips and I've seen the preview, and I'm like, oh man, I had to be really high to enjoy this. To to get financing for an independent film these days is is incredibly difficult yeah my assumption is not for this movie but for cloud atlas just because of how weird it was like it's not mm -hmm. if it if it's a like a war movie or something like that that you think yeah this is probably gonna do pretty well um and it didn't do poorly and now it's gonna come out in digital to make some more money um yep i feel like that's a risk some a normal investor might take but cloud atlas even though you have tom hanks involved in it i don't think that's I, I that seemed to me like maybe somebody was looking to take a loss to hide some money from a maybe. fucking business or some shit or or whatever the fuck and just to avoid paying taxes. Maybe and I'll and I'll tell you this from you know making movies all these years there there is investors I've had over the years that are saying they, that say to me hey man I just need some K ones I'm looking to take a loss on some of this uh, can you help me out mm. and we've said yes yes we can <laughs> um, there's been others who have you know delusions of grandeur of like yeah. man i'm gonna make the next blair witch for 13 grand yeah you know, i'm gonna give you thirteen thousand dollars and then they expect it to make a hundred million dollars which is extremely rare mm -hmm. obviously um and then you have a movie like this which you know when we talk to the writer here in a minute like it seemed like a passion project yeah and uh but to pull <laughs> off that kind of financing for something like this, you just can't do it anymore. And, and before we got on air, you and I were talking about even what we can get away with yeah. these days. Um, you know, in the past for me, it was everybody, it's weird, man. There's been this weird resurgence because uh, I think two or three of my movies were bought by Universal. Mm. Uh, Pool Boy and uh, FDR American Badass. And now those are on Amazon Prime. I guess mm. they sold them to, to Amazon Prime. Um, we don't have any control over them. The deals we sign with independent films are 10 year deals. Mm -hmm. So they're the studio owns them for 10 years and then you have to write a letter through your lawyer and then get the rights back and, and they'll, they'll give them back to you. Um, that being said, y you don't know where they're at. People email you all the time and say, Hey man, I'm, I'm just watch this movie for the first time. What the fuck? You never mm -hmm. told me. And I was like, well, they don't tell us either where they're going. Um, and there's been this weird resurgence of people who were watching these movies for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they're like, holy fucking shit, these are the craziest movies of all time. I don't understand why you're not making more of these these days. And I was right. like, man, I, it's a different time, and especially in comedy. Yep. Um, I don't know who would finance these right now. Uh, Range 15, obviously, we had to do Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. Helen Keller versus Night Wolves, I had to do Indiegogo. Um, shit, man, I don't know. I, what do you think we can get away with these days? Because Donnie O'Malley was here. And his movie got banned from Amazon. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think there has to be more context, I suppose, um, to, like, you can't just make a string of, and, and your movies were like that. They were chaos in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They were just but like, intentionally. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the way the St. James, Shreve James books are written as well. Yes. So it's just like one thing after another, and it's meant to be like, it's meant to be fast paced like that. Um, yep. It's almost like uh, an interpretation of physical comedy, but in writing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it's just like, like goof after goof after goof. Um, and it's very reminiscent of like uh, Blazing Saddles or Airplane. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like yeah. every, there's no serious part in the whole thing. Everything is fucked. Yes. Um, Which they tell you not to do <clears throat> in comedy. So, you know, over the years after doing all these films, I've I've gotten to meet everybody from my favorite writers mm -hmm. to directors to all this shit and. Uh, uh, I remember I did I did this gig with uh, the writers of the Wedding Crashers, mm -hmm. or actually we were up for the same gig, and uh, I got to chat with them because you're not it's not it's not like a weird competition or anything like somebody is somebody's gonna pick you and it's based on something else so you don't really care right so you don't feel like you're in a competition with them mm -hmm. and they were great guys and uh, 
I said to him, I was like, man, with wedding, wedding crashers, the only thing I, I didn't like is like, I didn't give a shit about the relationship at the end of the movie. Right. And whether or not they have it, they were like, well, you have to have it, unfortunately. You yeah. know? And when you go back and see it, the ending of the wedding crashers is just kind of tacked on where it's like, hey, we're all going to just go crash weddings now together. And then they're in that car, remember? Yeah. And it's just like a, a yay moment. Mm. But truthfully, it's like, I just wanted to see Vince Vaughn, Owen Wilson fuck shit up yeah. the entire movie, you know? Um, but you have to have something <clears throat> like that, whereas these books and movies do not, where the love yeah. interest, you know, I fuck, man, even the, I remember my agent's first thing with A Night She Cries, it was like, you can't kill the wife, a mother of eight kids. And I yeah. was like, oh no, she's going to die. Yeah. She's going to die real quick. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I don't think this is new. So what we're talking about is what you can do for a niche audience versus what you could do for a more mainstream audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And I know some people would call that selling out, but ultimately it's about, uh, the bigger we can make our brand, the more we can attack PC culture. Like you can't, you can't attack PC culture by, just being a complete anti PC person 24 hours a day. Like anybody that says, well, this, you know, this, this is problematic. You're like, fuck you. And just burn their house down. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. work. That's not how you it's, it's, it's a, uh, a, a social insurgency for lack of a better phrase. Like you can't get away with that shit. So what you have to do is you have to make your product a little bit more palatable and be right smartly. Like you fucking insert anti PC shit in a smarter way than you were doing before. Smarter might not be the right word, but more clever. You know what I mean? Mm. So, for example, <clears throat> not that they're not that it's clever necessarily, but with South Park, and it's the whole anti-hero thing, right? And it's the the two best examples of it to me are South Park and uh, and The Sopranos, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody remembers that last the final episode of Sopranos where the family sitting in that diner and another dude walks through the door, the music's playing and you're everybody's wonder one wondering what's going to happen. But I felt myself rooting for Tony, who was a complete piece of shit yeah, yeah. to not get murdered. Same with yeah. his family, right? Yeah. Same but, with breaking bad. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I, I rooted for Walter <clears throat> White, even though, he well, was I mean, Walter White was, uh, you know, he, the character development was good, but ultimately his original purpose was, you know, Can't meaningful. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. there was something yeah. to it. With Tony, <clears throat> he's just a mobster. He's an asshole. So despite the years of character development with him and knowing that he is a complete sociopath, um, killed his nephew. Spoiler alert. It's mm-hmm. been out for 50 years. So if you haven't seen <laughs> it, go fuck yourself. Um, like a lot of shit happened with him. <clears throat> Still, you feel like you're rooting for it. And the reason is because you can make a character palatable by holding, you're, you're, you're essentially holding up a real representation of someone to the audience. But you know, everybody in the room knows that the behavior is bad, right? Right. You're not rooting for the behavior. You're rooting for the character, the person, the human being. So you can do it that way. And with Cartman, no character in film or television has said more fucked up shit than Eric Cartman. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way, right? Because no one's existed that long to even say it that long. Yeah, man. How, how many seasons are they on now? 20? I have no idea. It it's, feels like 20 somewhere in there. Right? I think it's more than that. Didn't Might they be. start in 97? Yeah. Let's look it up. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, um, for sure. Oh, man. Yeah, they started in 97. Uh, so they're on season 23, uh, going into 24. Um, no signs <clears> of slowing down either. No, they just keep cranking it out. So... The audience knows there's three other characters. Kenny doesn't really talk, but there's, there's two other verbal characters in that situation that are constantly judging what Cartman says and showing the audience that what he, the racist and homophobic and sexist shit and just generally fucked up shit he says and does, like murdering a guy and turning him into chili, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody knows that's all wrong, but that character still exists, and we still laugh at the fucked up shit he does even though we know it's wrong because it gives you, it's almost like it gives you cover. You know what I mean? Like it's okay to laugh at that because of whatever reason, because we know it's wrong. Right. Like, Oh, I don't really think that's right, but it's, it's, it's subtle. It's more subtle that way because <clears throat> I don't remember who said it, but real racism is quiet. 
You know what I mean? Like people don't tell fucked up, like casually racist jokes to be racist. You know what I mean? They're doing yeah. it to be edgy and funny or whatever the fucking case is. Real racism is like looking around before you say something and then, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah It's yeah. a little more subversive, I guess, yeah. than that. So people know that. People know, like especially in the comedy world, <clears throat> people say fucked up shit all the time. I'm like, well, it's, it's a joke. I don't mean it. It's just funny. It's, it's, it's supposed to make racism look absurd. It's not to inf- reinforce the stereotype. So I think if you can do it like that, maybe, maybe it works. I don't know. Yeah. These uh, days, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I don't watch a whole lot of like, t- uh, film comedy anymore. Well, there isn't any. That's why. I mean, they, they, they're at, when's the last comedy film that's come out? I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think Night School with Kevin Hart was the last one I remember. Well, that one they did, the one that Seth Rogen did with the kids. I oh, Good Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it, but I heard it was really funny. Yeah. So uh, that was last August. So you're looking at uh, four months, and that was the only one of the year. I think yeah. Night School was actually the year before. Um, that's how long it's yeah. been. The reason why we're talking about this today is obviously, you know, we have a writer from a mega movie coming on here in a second, but. Um, uh, we were also talking about janitor, mm. the, the janitor, <coughs> and making that. And um, you know, I know we had mentioned it a month or so ago, maybe doing an Indiegogo for it. Uh, we were talking about how fucked up it is in there because it's the St. James movie where it's just just so crazy. Yeah, um, and whether or not you could get away with that anymore, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I mean, it's a you can get away with anything ultimately. That's well, not Donnie the didn't. Donnie O'Malley didn't with, uh, with his movie, right? Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, but we could put it on our website if we wanted to. Like, there's a lot of different ways to... I'm just saying, technically, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. But can you do it and still accomplish your other goals, like making the show bigger? Like, I know a lot of people, and this happens all the time, when Metallica cut their hair between the Black Album and their, and their like, load and reload and shit, mm-hmm. people are like, oh, they cut their hair, they're selling out. And I remember... Uh, Jason Newstead, the bassist at the time, said, yeah, you're goddamn right we're selling out every single fucking theater we go to. Seat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So that's the point. The point is to, uh, even if you have to soften the edges a little bit to get bigger so you can promote the greater idea, which is like, I mean, for for our community, it's so many different things. It's not just about being a crazy asshole all the time, which we enjoy doing, obviously, and our whole community. It's my favorite thing to do. It is uh, amazing, but... (laughs) <laughs> the point of all this, <clears throat> the reason Jared started the Facebook group in the first place was to, you know, create a sense of community. And the bigger we can make it, the better, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, the more lives that we'll be able to influence, the bigger this shit gets. And it's not just, uh, <clears throat> it's not just an ideological thing where we're influencing the way people think or providing an outlet or whatever. We're doing real shit, like helping Richard Stace call get justice. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And there's a other many, many, many other examples of that. So that's what a powerful, bigger audience can do. And that's what matters to me. I don't really give a shit if someone thinks <clears throat> that we're quote unquote selling out because we make something that's not as rabid as it used to be. That's I mean, this is not how my brain works. I don't care about that. Well, look, I don't feel in drinking bros. We have sold out. Um, that's the no. good thing. No. Um, I, I'll get a. a, a eh. I'll probably get a handful of messages a week about, you know, Matt and Evan, right? Uh, well, they'll be like, oh, those guys sold out and they couldn't do edgy content anymore because of Black Rifle Coffee. Now, Black Rifle Coffee, I, I agree with you in your point, where that is for the greater good of not just in the United States, but globally. I mean, that, that, mm-hmm. that is a global <clears throat> brand um, where, yes, you have the opportunity to help millions and millions and millions of people. Um, so like whenever I get those, I'm like, ah, eh, man, you don't understand, you know. They they had to, like, it's just what it is, what it is. Mm. When you're doing something comedically based, though, I, I that one I always struggle with. I always go back and forth of like, I'm just gonna do what I want and fuck everybody, right? Um, but y- you're right. Like there comes a point where I don't know. Will people fucking cancel it? Will whatever? Like you know, shit. The first three weeks, this my second book was banned from Amazon. Mm. For what three and a half weeks until yeah. drinking bros fucking raged and got it back up on there, but um, I don't know what the line is. I'm, I hate that there even is one. To be honest with you, I can't fucking stand it, man, <laughs> and it drives me crazy every single day. Uh, which is why we wanted to have this in particular guest on today, where 
This dude was able to write a movie and get a hundred million dollars yeah. in independent financing for it. Like, yeah, it's crazy. It uh, it's it's nuts, man. I mean, it's absolutely nuts to wrap your mind around. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest meeting I took independently, finance like finance wise for mm-hmm. film was about five million dollars. Mm-hmm. When I was just like, all right, cool. But the strings that were attached to that five million were mind altering. Where I was just like, it was a, it was to make in, these. In, Independent movies, there was, I think, 10 was, was what I was supposed to make. Mm. Um, but seven out of the 10 had to be horror films. Right. Um, you know, and all these movies were about a half million dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. And, and I was just like, man, I don't want to make this. Like, the, they brought in these horror writers. Because mm. they weren't horror comedies, by the way. They were yeah. straight horror films. And they had, you know, big actors attached already. And uh, they brought in these scripts. And it was just like, oh, God. Do I really want to sit here for the next? It was f- over the course of five years. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to make these movies. Do I really want to sit here and watch these fucking horror movies that I hate? You know, sit there on set every day for five years and make this for for that kind of cash. And ultimately, I backed out. Where I was just like, no, I yeah. don't. Um, <clears throat> they wanted to front load all of the horror films, right? And then shoot the comedies last. And I was like, yeah, I gotta wait fucking four years to shoot mm-hmm. the goddamn comedies. No, I'm good. <laughs> Um, but I, that is something that's the biggest struggle I, I go through every day with, with mm. comedy in particular, where, man, I don't want there to be any rules. I'm tired of it. I'm just sick of fucking people labeling everything. And I just want to make whatever I want as crazy as it, it is. Um, yeah. But I mean, I mean, the way I think about it is preparing food. Like yeah, everybody's got one thing they like or don't like, and you can kind of work around it for the most part if you're going to a restaurant, but you can't, uh, like the the idea of creating a menu at a restaurant is to make it the most palatable for the most amount of people. And look, we're not like there's not going to be any there's no version of all of this where we're not being dicks, talking shit, making fun of people or whatever. That just doesn't that's not who we yeah, are yeah, as yeah, human beings. Course. But if we can do it in a different way that brings more eyes and then Ultimately, more people are talking shit, even though even if it's less harshly about the absurdity of American politics, for example, just as one example, if more people are talking about how fucked up it is, it's kind of like this Epstein meme that just kept going and going and going. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the right or the left. It was everybody talking about that shit. And if you can accomplish something like that, then it's a tribute to the community, not just us. You know what I mean? Because ultimately, as much as we consider this our child, our baby, you know what I mean? Creatively, it's their community too. Yeah. So, I mean, we always want to do right by them and make sure that they feel like they're included. That's why we're still, still, <clears throat> there are no two companies on earth that are this large between our media company and Black Rifle that have like senior level people that are readily ac- accessible to the general public, to fans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that yeah. doesn't exist in a real company. No. So obviously that's a commitment that's been made and it's not going to change at any point. I mean, obviously the ability to respond diminishes the bigger the demand becomes, Mm -hmm. but uh, it's the same thing with the comedy. I mean, we can't always have midgets ripping dicks off. Well, we we, we just interviewed a porn star yesterday. She'll be on the show in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No, I'm just saying like, it's uh, if you want to see, like if you're out there and you're a drinking bro or broette and you want to see drinking bros material and mainstream, like we have to be smarter about it as a community in two ways. One, as writers and creators and, and actors and producers, we have to be better at being smarter about the way we deliver our message. The message being we don't, we're not offended by bullshit like that. We're offended by our veterans being treated poorly by people hating cops for no reason and all this other stuff. That's what offends us. So if we can make our message wrap it in something a little more palatable and deliver it, then we're still accomplishing the same goal. The other part is like none of it happens without the support of the community. So <clears throat> I don't really worry about this because there's a lot of smart people in Drinker Bros, but <sighs> there's always like a couple of assholes in any group. Yeah, that are just like purists or whatever. Like I don't fucking like change. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I got it, man. I mean, we want to be fucking crazy assholes all the time. Believe me. Like if you heard our private conversations, you would be horrified. Uh, but 
you can't we, we can't always do that like if you want to be part of a fucking a, a global brand and i don't mean just us i mean you as a community the drinker bros if you want to be part of a global brand you got to get on board here with this like it's it takes everybody do, moving in, in unison together to make kind of this shit, this shit happen so if we're gonna <clears throat> if we were gonna do a crowd fund uh for you know a range 15 sequel or janitors or ultimate eskimo which is a little bit was which is way more mainstream than either one of those two things yes um that's a traditional rom-com yeah it is and uh like we're we there's we could go find financing for that movie probably pretty easily honestly we would lose all creative advantage so yeah, you get nothing when you're yeah whenever there's a financer involved of, of that level you get yeah. you get you get fucking 30 yeah, percent yeah. creative set. so this is tops. where this is where we need you guys is understand the situation we are still the same people that we've always been and we're going to continue being those people but to to make shit like this happen to get bigger and spread this message f- further like you the the listener comes into play so much more than they realize yeah. Like the support and understanding the tra- not the transition, but the maturing of the brand <coughs> and all that bullshit. Because range fifteen doesn't happen without them, without the drinker bills. Oh no, no, no. Never not at all. happens. Uh, a million years. And neither does any of this other bullshit. Yeah. And uh, you know, looking down the road, I would if as a as a fan of the community, um, which I am, I like the idea of being part of things getting bigger and bigger. Like it's it's meaningful to to see a drinking bro or somebody wearing a black rifle hat and a fucking uh airport when i'm walking through and they have no idea who i am but we're both wearing black rifle shit we're just like hey what's up yeah like i don't know that motherfucker of course all i know is that because of that badge they're wearing which is a gun on a fucking flag that they we have something in common for sure we're part of the same general community even if we disagree on everything else that's what it takes is community you can't do any of this shit alone yeah. And you can't do it when, when the first inclination from the fan base is to, to tear shit down and attack. Not that they've been doing that. I'm not like this has never actually happened before. I'm just saying, Black Rifle caught some heat when they started to go a little mainstream. Mainstream, mm-hmm. um, and Drinking Bros did as well, I guess. When uh, Matt and Evan had to peel out, I guess it wasn't Drinking Bros taking heat. It was more of those two specifically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you just have to understand their situation, like. Matt and Evan have not changed as human beings. We talk to them every single day. Yeah. They're the same people. They're just trying to accomplish the goal. Like, you shrink the goal down to a small, like, I can't accomplish 10 things at once, but I can probably do two. So how do I do those two the best I can do it? And it's not about um, selling out or making more money or any of that bullshit. It's about what did I get into this business for to affect change and, and help veterans and first responders and be anti PC and all this shit, but you can't do it if you piss everybody in the industry off all the time, or you can't gain more followers. If 30 to 40% of the shit you do turns somebody completely off. You know what I mean? Right. You got to walk. Smart comedy is about walking up to the line of outrage and seeing where that line is and testing it and maybe pushing it a little further out. Right. But it's not about, just moving to the other side of the line and fucking putting your fingers up in the air and say, fuck everybody. Right. It just doesn't work that way. So we're going to, I'm not saying that like the show of drinker bros is going to be fucked up forever. Yeah. It's not changing. We've got some disgusting shows on the pipeline. Yeah. There's some good ones coming. We were just talking about comedy in general in real life. Yeah. Um, So, but I'm I'm just saying like, if we want to make, if we want to continue to make bigger, cause that's what we want to do. We want to make, cause that's what I mean. Like, you're really good at that, writing that stuff and producing and directing it. So if we're going to do that, we can't do it without the community. Of course. And I don't want yeah. the, I don't want them to read that as selling out or abandoning our principles or any of that shit. Cause that's not what it is at all. So trans Frank is off the table for you is what you're saying. I actually think trans Frank, <laughs> I absolutely, I think trans Frank could absolutely be done in the same way that fucking, uh, uh, what's this one with the Hitler, the imaginary friend Hitler? Uh, Jojo uh, Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely think Trans Frank, if you did it the right way, I believe it absolutely could be done. 
You know what's funny, man, is uh, I'd love because it's so crazy, man. We bitch. I, I bitch about this all the time. If if there was a billionaire that was, I'm surprised we don't have. We have seven point two million listeners now. That's what we're we we just crossed. We have seven point two million listeners. I'm surprised we don't have one billionaire in the group who's just like, "Hey, man, here's fucking twenty million. Go yeah. make all the most fucked up things you could possibly think of." Yeah. By the way, I would do it. I would do trans Frank. I would do all of those <clears throat> in two seconds. If there was a, a a huge billionaire backing it and just being like, "Hey, man, I don't really give a fuck what happens." Like, um, and, and even if it got banned everywhere, you could just screen it. It would become the old school way of like, "Hey, man." I've got that movie. It's over here, man. You like, can. <laughs> I, I honestly think that we could make transferring. I look. It, it just, if you can make a TV like one of the most successful, not TV, but Netflix shows, you, which is yeah. about a guy who is absolutely insane and murders women. Yeah, yeah, that's what he does. Yes. But for all intents, he is the hero of the story. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I root for him to get away with these murders. Yeah. If, That's serious. I, I'm I'm one episode <laughs> away from completing season two right now. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm rooting for him to get away yeah. from these murders. So it's like, uh, and it got picked up for season three, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's the same as the Cartman thing. Like we know that that's abhorrent behavior, but it's interesting, and some of it's kind of funny and fucked up. Yeah. And m- media is about escapism. You know what I mean? Like there's some like documentaries and stuff where you just want to find out information or you think something is interesting, but for the most part. Fiction is about escapism, mm-hmm. and it's also about examining humanity. I and I'm I'm not going to get up on a soapbox about trans Frank, but some of these issues keep going farther and farther and farther, and it's getting w- like wild. I know, like how far it's going. We talked about this on the fake news uh, last week <clears throat> when neoliberalism and progressivism run amok. Like you lose your sense. It's the same thing that happens in f- fascist dictatorships. You lose your sense of irony, right? You, you lose th- your sense of how absurd life really is. It's stupid. Like our private moments alone. Think about the next time you're alone and you do something really stupid or gross, just be like, man, if somebody made a movie about this one thing, no one would watch it because it's too fucked up. But it's funny and it's real. Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so comedy like that is about holding a mirror up and showing like, like, yeah, we're, I don't give a fuck about trans people. Like, I don't hate trans people. I don't give two fucks about that shit. But this is about how, abs- it's not about them. It's about progressivism and how absurd it's become and just making fun of everything. Right. You know what I mean? It has nothing to do with, like, being anti-trans. And it will be cast as that. I guarantee you. People are like, well, it's the most anti-trans movie ever. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Because we don't care about that shit. It's about doing something that's fucking super funny, but also having this underlying message of, Look how crazy life really is. Honestly. Yeah. That's what I, I think we could get away with making transferring. Well, look, somebody out there, uh, if you have a fuck ton of money, go ahead and throw it our way, and I'll make all this goddamn shit. I mean, push it as far as you could possibly go, because our, our next guest who we're going to get to after the sponsors, somebody gave Wes uh, $100 million to make this, this war movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, it is possible, and those people exist. I, I wish I could just I, ask him point blank who it is, but that's, yeah. it's obviously real un, uncouth, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but we do got some sponsors who pay for this whole shit wagon to be on the air. First and foremost, talking about ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Uh, look, they're 25% off for the next month. Boom. They're not fucking leaving. They're not fucking leaving, dude. 25% off mattresses, pillows, sheets, adjustable bases, you name it. Uh, I'm, we're throwing every other promo code out the window, dude. That's it. 25% off everything in the store. And that works with the pay-as-you-go program. So if you're, if you're at home and you're like, man, can I still use the 36-month pay-as-you-go program with no interest with the 25% off? Yes, you can. Knock shit down to like 20 bucks a month for mattresses. So if you need mattresses or pillows... Or, or sheets, or you just want an adjustable base because it's fucking awesome. Now's your chance to go and do that, man. Um, dude, I, I don't know how Ghostbed is making any money off of this at this point. Uh, not my job. Not my job to care. Nope. I love their product so much that I'm, I'm happy about it, but uh, eh, not my job to care. Uh, so go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today and get on it, man. Uh, 
fuck, what is there? This is a leap year month, right? Yeah, it's 29 yeah, days. Yeah, it's 29 days. So you got uh, 22 days left. Or whatever, whenever this airs. I don't know when this airs. Um, next up, we've got KillCliffCBD.com. 25 milligrams of CBD in every single can at Kill Cliff. Use the promo code Drinking Bros for 20% off, and that gives you free shipping. 20% off a case, free shipping. Knocks it down to like fucking three ninety a can mm. somewhere in there. Uh, you can get a can of Monster, or you can get actual CBD in a can and enjoy your life. I, we, Dan and I drank this every single night. That is real. I use my own promo code. Another case just showed up in my house yesterday. Uh, I don't care. I'm, I'm pretty shameless about it. Um, use my own promo code. I don't, yeah, I don't fucking care. care. Do okay. what I want. Yep. Uh, mango is your favorite. Grape is mine. Um, 25 milligrams. And, I, and a lot of you say, hey, man, I got a job where I got a drug test. You will not test for this. Uh, it says it on the back of the can. The Kill Cliff is one of the only brands that you can trust on this. <laughs> um, look, Kill Cliff's been around forever. Yeah. Shit, they were in range 15. Yep. Um, we've been working with Kill Cliff for five years at this point. Uh, we love them. And this is my favorite product that they've ever made. KillCliffCBD.com. Uh, promo code drinking bros 20 percent off you got aches or pains man or, or trouble sleeping i get trouble sleeping so i i drank a can of this before i go to bed man it kind of levels me out mm -hmm. uh, which is what i'm amped about um promo code drinking bros 20 percent off free shipping it is the best uh next up <laughs> we got express vpn expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros Protect your digital butthole. Yeah, you got to be careful with your butthole these days. Really do. Really do got to be careful with your digital butthole these days. Um, look, this is a seamless app that runs in the background of, of every device you have. iPhone, uh, iPad, uh, laptop, hard talk, desktop, you name it, dude. Uh, it's running in the background of that. Protects you from uh, cybersecurity. Um, people trying to break into your shit. Get yep. your, your bank account info, everything else. Uh, but the beauty is too, uh, it also helps you if you, if you got a job where they don't let you watch porn, mm -hmm. um, breaks through every firewall. It's important to be able to break through firewalls. Yeah. March madness is coming up too. And they won't let you watch ESPN or true TV. The one, yeah. the, the one time a year, everybody watches true TV <laughs> it's during March madness. Yeah. Um, it'll break through all of those and you'll be able to watch everything. $7 a month. That's it. Uh, if you sign up for a year, you get three months for free. So that's it, dude. It's like 70 bucks. It's a great deal, yeah. It's fucking awesome, man. Um, no, it's less than $63 a year. Yeah, protect your shit, dude. I've had it run in the background of mine forever, dude. Um, and I just get a little $7 fee. Ding, ding. That's mm -hmm. it. Um, go to expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros today and get that shit. Last but not least, we've got getroman.com forward slash drinking bros. Boner pills. Boners. Boners. Yeah. Hard dicks. Erections. Uh, look, if you, want, if you don't want to go into a doctor, if you've got ED, um, boom, you can go online. Free doctor's visits. Uh, free shipping. Or if you just want to party. Very discreet packaging. Yeah. Your wife's not going to know. If you want to throw one down, I've thrown, I, I throw one down mm. for a weekend. You know, you want to have a weekender and just go old school. Um, really tear the place apart. Yep. It's the best, dude. It's the best. I don't know if we should be saying that. They've never said anything. It's fine. I think it's fine, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Recreational boner taking pills. Yeah. yeah. Well, fuck it. You know? Uh, they're great, dude. Um, and again, discreet packaging. No one's going to know. So you can surprise your wife for Valentine's Day. Uh, and then you can do whatever it's you want. It's true. It's coming up soon. Fucking surprise her for Secretary's Day. Maybe she's a secretary. You know? Hmm. Maybe you can write her like Secretariat. Uh, and enjoy all that. I think all... Race horses are male. Yeah. But whatever. Nah, I think I think there's some Phillies out there. I don't believe so. Motown Phillies. Yeah, they're in the Kentucky Derby, man. I'm I'm a big Derby fan. Uh go to getroman.com forward slash drinking bros today. Free doctor visit. Free shipping. All you have to do is take a like a little tiny quiz. Mm. Hey man. And then boom, you get them in the mail and you're ready to rock. Uh we've gotten a bunch of funny emails from listeners who are mm. like, yo, man, my wife. It was really pissed off yeah. because I just railed her all weekend. Get off of me. Yeah. Dude. Well, sorry. Sorry about it. Yeah. Um, let's get into uh, let's get into to, to, to Mr. West Took, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, give him a call. Give him a jangle. Get him on the horn. Welcome to Drinking Bros. D'Anthony, you seem lively as ever today. 
Yeah, I just uh, smoked a whole big fat bag of crack before the show. Something happened. Um, no, nothing happened. Okay. Because you're, you're near death, I feel like. No, I just, uh, you know, dead inside. Yeah, yeah, definitely dead inside. But it's inside. like, I guess you could say that's half dead. I mean, look, war does that to him, man. We get a special guest on the show who wrote a war movie. Talking to Wes Took today. Wes, how are you? Great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Hell yeah, man. Um, dude, you wrote a, an epic adventure, I would say. Um, you wrote one of those huge Hollywood movies where you're like, holy shit, how does that get made? How long does it take? You were, you were the writer of Midway, which is available on digital this week, correct? Correct, yeah, and uh, DVD and Blu-ray and everything uh, next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I look, what's it, what's it take to write a, a movie of that size? It's, I, look, I'm speculating right now. That looks like a budget of somewhere in the in the hundred to one twenty range. I would say. Yeah, it was really expensive, and that you know, the thing is, it doesn't have a superhero in it, so nobody actually wants to make the movie. So it was one of those things when you're first writing it, you're thinking, you know, I'm I'm writing it, and I love I love writing it, but the odds of this getting made are close to zero. Right. So basically, and, what you just said is that the American soldier in World War II is not a superhero. Is that what I'm getting from yeah. you? Can we get a? <laughs> yeah. can we, Go ahead and cut that clip out, producers. Awesome. Uh, awesome. I'm five you, minutes in. I'm your career is over. <laughs> <laughs> How but, about a superhero not wearing tights? Is that cool? Can yeah, that? Well, exactly. We wear, we wear tights. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're, you, tighties. Uh, yeah. Tighty whities. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, you're right. It's one of those things in Hollywood these days. And I just try to tell this to the audience all the time. They literally only want to make superhero movies. So with a movie like this, did you write this script first or was this a pitch and you were hired to write it? So I was doing something else with this director named Roland Emmerich, who loves to blow things up. And uh, that's his that's his whole bag. Uh, that's you, his bag. Just yeah. loves blowing. Tell the up. audience what else he's made, because it's everything well, you mean, could blow, blow up. Independence in the Day, yep. uh, the day after tomorrow, the Patriot 2012. He's he's like the apocalyptic Michael Bay. Yeah. You know what I mean? it's like, <laughs> exactly. He's like, fuck this world. I'm blowing it up. I'm blowing it up. We're all done here. Yeah, so I was, I was having lunch with that dude, and I was like, what's the one that got away? And he's like, I always wanted to make a movie about the Battle of Midway, which shocked me because I didn't expect him to say it. And also, like, I'd made a diorama about the Battle of Midway. I was in, I was in seventh grade. I was always, like, a total, you know, military history geek. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, you know, what happened? And he said, I want, in 1995, I, like, had this great screenwriter, and we're all ready to go, but his deal is at Columbia. And Columbia is bought by Sony. Like, yep. So he takes this script in, and the president of Columbia is like, um, yeah, there's no way the first script I'm making with our new Japanese partners is about the greatest defeat in Japanese military history. So it died, and then Michael Bay came out with Pearl Harbor, so that kind of like salted the earth for another 10 years. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ugh. It was that So it, it was that long ago. That, I mean, that was, you're looking at 20 years ago now. 25. Yeah, man. He wanted, yeah. he wanted to make this in 95, yeah. And then we, so we started talking about five years ago. And as you know, this is actually quick for Hollywood, as you guys know. It takes freaking forever to do anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I started writing it. And that was the thing. I decided I was going to spec it because I just knew that if we sold it to some studio, it was going to sit in development and then never actually make the movie. And sure enough, when we had the script, lots of people liked it, but they had to independently finance it. So it ended up being arguably like the most expensive independent movie ever made. Holy shit. So this, was in, this entire thing was independently financed? Yes. Yeah. Insane. I mean, I was getting on the plane wow. to go. They were going to shoot in Hawaii. I was on the plane. I was like, when I land, there's no way this movie's actually happening. Like, great that I get to fl get flown out to Hawaii, but there's, you know, until the final check cleared, you never believe they're actually going to make it. No, that has to be the most expensive independent film of all time. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's an argument that maybe the Wachowskis made that Cloud Atlas movie, but they had this crazy government credit, and we didn't have that. So, yeah, you're walking onto these massive i mean none of these assets existed either right it's not like you can dredge up the japanese carriers that sank so you got to build you know, in this huge you know stage in montreal build an entire carrier deck um so there's no way to get around you couldn't make this movie for a budget there's you know there's no way that this is going to be made for 20 million dollars just physically impossible yeah plus it's a period piece um yeah. so, so i yeah. mean geez you, you gotta you know a lot of people don't think about that though just the wardrobe alone on a movie like this is expensive Everything was expensive. I mean, the so those torpedo bombers, um, everyone hated them so much that when they were finally decommissioned after the Battle Midway, they literally just shoved those things off the sides of the carriers, and not a single one existed. So, you know, you can't just go rent one of those from a museum. You had to build it by hand in Vancouver and then, you know, train it across to Montreal where we shot and reassemble the thing. Oh, so the only actual boy. model of those, yeah, we're getting contacted by museums who all want to have it because it's the only one in existence. That's insane, man. 
Um, yeah, man. It was when you got there, did you feel the pressure of that much independent money? Because, look, I, I've shot a ton of independent movies, not anywhere near a budget like that. I Look, I felt pressured directing a movie that was $1 million, let alone 120 you know? Yeah, I mean, I, to me, though, the pressure was more the pressure from like, these are real people's stories and these are real heroes. And you didn't want to I didn't if you make something stupid or cheesy, you feel like you've let them down. And, you know, was, we were actually really lucky to have a lot of, you know, Navy vets around to help us try to get the period details right, but also having them on set and looking over and realizing, like, you know, you're making a movie about Nimitz, who's like the patron saint in the Navy. Like, you can't, you can't blow it. Like, that's the most important thing. Or that's where I felt the pressure. Yeah. Um, were you on set for the entire I – w- I would imagine a shoot like this is, is probably fairly lengthy. Um, were you on set the entire time? Yeah, 61 days of shooting. So I was on set basically the whole time. Um, and the first two weeks we got to shoot in Hawaii, which was not exactly hazard pay. Um, but it was actually really good for the crew because we were shooting, you know, at Pearl Harbor. So every day their buses are taking them past, you know, the wreck of the Arizona. And, you know, I kind of put everyone in the right frame of mind. And then the rest of the movie was shot on stage in Montreal. Okay. Uh, so you, sh- you shipped everybody up to Canada. Uh, you, you save a little money there, I guess. Uh, that's not bad. Um, yeah. what, what about the casting choices? So, you know, typically when you write a movie, you have people in mind, actors in mind that you would like to play the roles. How amped were you that, that you guys got Woody Harrelson? I mean, that was a dream. I mean, <laughs> the yeah. guy, it's also interesting that like Woody's from Texas. He's actually from a town really close to where, uh, he grew up near where Nimitz was raised too. So like Woody had this connection to Nimitz and like, as soon as he got the role, he went to the Nimitz museum. And I will say that for all the actors, like, you know, I hate to speak well of actors because generally they're a pain in the ass. Yeah. But these guys yeah. all like prepped. They read the, you know, they read autobiographies. Like they came, like they understood that these are real people and they, you know, approached this with like a seriousness of purpose that I really appreciated. Like generally speaking, when you're on set with actors, you're like trying to hurt cats and get people out of trailers. And this movie, like everyone showed up, there's total professionals. And, you know, it was a gift. Like there's no way we would have made our schedule if they hadn't been like totally on it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm going to read off some of the, the cast list here because this, this is a big boy cast. you got Patrick Wilson, Woody Harrelson, Mandy Moore, Dennis Quaid, Aaron Eckhart, Nick Jonas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Darren, look, Darren Chris was he coming off of uh, uh, the Versace at that time? Uh, yes, exactly. He was, like, rolling basically right off it. And, uh, there, I mean, that's a perfect example. Like, you know, he doesn't have a huge role in the movie, but he's playing a real guy, a real hero, who unfortunately dies during the battle. And, like, he showed up and he'd done so much research on the guy. He's like, I think I should have a Texarkana accent because he was from here, but he moved here. And I was like, good on you, man. Like, you actually put in the work. Um, so, yeah, he was, he was kind of emblematic of all those guys. Yeah, that dude's legit, man. I After Versace, I, I, I we told the audience he was just going to sweep all the awards, and that's exactly what he did. Um, yeah. He comes to play. How is Quaid? How is Dennis Quaid against the machine? Quaid is a trip. I mean, like, you n- you never know what you're going to get. He's perfect for Halsey because <laughs> he's got, like, that guttural, like, I've been, you know, been up since 6 a.m. drinking and smoking voice. Like, it kind of worked. Uh, chances he's- are he has been. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a more important question. Did Randy Quaid show up at yeah. all? Yeah. Uh, oh, I fe- man. I feel like he just, he may just, like, kind of follow Dennis around, sleep outside uh, his house. They don't house. talk. They I know don't they don't talk, but, I mean, like, just to be close, you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> That would have been an entirely different movie if you would have swapped out the lead for Randy Quaid, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, my Dennis Quaid story is that, so we did a press for the movie in Hawaii, and he shows up with this woman who's, like, comfortably 40 years younger than he is. And I'm like, good for you, man. And next morning you wake up and you go online, and there are all these stories about he's asked this woman to marry him. Like, yeah. So, yeah, so that was, like, actually the day we were doing press. And suddenly all the press was not about our movie. The press was about, like, you know, Dennis having asked this 26-year-old grad student to marry him. Yeah, and they're they're engaged right now, right? I guess. Yeah, that's that's real life. Um, I I have a Dennis Quaid story. I cannot share it on air, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but let's just say he was up all night um, in uh, in Austin, Texas, and yeah, he rages. Dennis Quaid rages. I, no doubt. I feel like a lot of people have Dennis Quaid stories. They're not allowed to tell on air. <laughs> he re- <laughs> when he was in Montreal, when he was in Montreal, he ended up renting out this suite that they have this. Uh, one of those hotel suites that um, when Yoko and Lennon were uh, at the peak, they were like renting out hotels and doing like sleep-ins or lions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Christ. they kept that suite exactly as it was. So Dennis like rented out that suite and brought his guitar and was like playing Beatles songs all night to a bunch of our cast hmm. and crew members. Is Yoko still is Yoko still lying down there or what? 
Yeah. <laughs> I think for the right price, anything's possible. Right? They're, just yeah. paying, they're paying her a couple mil a year just to lie in bed. It is. That, that's classic <laughs> Quaid, renting it out and then just playing Beatles songs a coup. Just going straight acoustic, right? He wasn't plugging totally. in. Yeah. I'm sure he was no. sober that whole time. Oh, oh yeah. God, that's right. great. And you know the crew <laughs> The crew had to put up with it, too, because they're just like, well, it's Dennis Quaid, so we, we kind of have to hang out and listen to the, this, this Beatles repertoire. Because there's nothing worse than when an actor pulls out an, a, an acoo guitar There's nothing set. worse than when anyone pulls out a guitar that isn't <laughs> a professional musician. <laughs> uh, it's totally true. So when it came out, because, uh, look, oftentimes when you write something, um, you know, it doesn't always turn out as you hoped it would. Um, did this movie turn out the way you hoped it would when you were writing it? Yes. I mean, the, when I started writing it, I was like, this is an impossible, essentially an impossible story to tell because it should be at least a 10 hour miniseries. Like it's such a sprawling battle with so many cool little side alleys. Like how are you possibly going to tell it in two hours? And, you know, Roland, from Roland's point of view is like, well, no one's been able to show people what this stuff actually looked like. You know, if you go back and look at the original Midway, they were literally like ripping out clips from previous movies like the Tor Tor Tor. And, you know, they, they didn't have the budget to put anyone in the cockpit. And, you know, Roland had shot enough of these like, you know, space alien movies with people in a cockpit. That I thought, you know, at least he can put you in there and that will look cool and that will be different. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I feel like the cast brought it. And, you know, it's if nothing else, it's really it's trying to be intense and show you how insane these guys were. I mean, I can't imagine anything more bonkers than strapping yourself into a plane and turning yourself into a bomb. You know, it's, it's just like inconceivable to my brain. So, you know, I feel like he, he kind of painted that picture for people who may not have known what that was like. Yeah. Uh, how'd you get involved in military history? Were, were, were your parents in the military, like fathers, uncles, grandfathers, any of that stuff? Yeah. So my grandfather was, uh, he was at Naval Academy. He was actually the same class as Darren Chris's character. Mm. Um, and probably did some of the design work in the enterprise, the carrier at the middle of the movie. And then, yeah, my uncle was career Navy and, you know, so grew up around it. And my dad had always wanted to go Navy, but he blew out his knee in the era before knee surgery. So like could never meet the physical qualifications. So it was, you know, it was one of those things was just always around our family. Like James fighting ships was my comic book. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Mine was asthma. Couldn't get in. <laughs> to- totally kidding. Totally kidding. Well, my, di- my dick was too big, so I yeah. had to get a dick reduction. <laughs> yeah, you you have medicine in real life. Dan's killed hundreds of people, so mm-hmm. um, uh, he can always relate to this. Um, but for me, yeah, the only place I served was at Olive Garden. Uh, but I was really good. I was employee, employee of the month one time at Olive Garden. They put my, my picture up. Uh, what else have you written um, so far here? I, I'm looking at it. Uh, you worked on the Colony series. Yeah, I worked on... Uh... So I, you know, I came out here and I started out on TV and yeah, I was on Colony a couple of years and I worked on this show called John Claude Van Johnson starring John Claude Van Damme, which was totally bonkers one season experience um, mm-hmm. working with that guy. Was that Sci Fi Channel? Uh, that was on Amazon. Yeah, it was oh, on, on Amazon. Amazon. That's it right. was That's like right. he. It, it was kind of a spoof almost, wasn't it? Yeah, he was playing himself, but yeah. he's like a B movie actor who's actually doing these movies because he's a secretly a secret agent. <laughs> and you know, you want to talk about Dennis Quaid stories? John Claude Van Damme stories are just oh, next man. level. That guy. Oh, dude, yeah. it's it's beyond. Um, but his level of fame around the world, like we make fun of him in America, but his level of fame around the world is crazy. Like people actually really do love the guy. So I understand why he's out of his tits. Um, do you have any crazy John Claude stories? So many crazy John Claude stories. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, there's. I mean. Th- the famous story about him is like before he was famous, he was cast to be in Predator and he was cast to be the Predator. So basically it's just because the guy can do crazy stunts and splits. They're like, well, we'll put him in a green suit and have him run around the set. Sure. So he shows up and thinks he's actually playing the villain. So he goes to the producer the first day and he's like, I think it was actually, I think it was Joel Silver. who's like a huge guy in Hollywood. He's like, Massive, um, yeah. I just want to tell you that the villain looks really stupid. He's a green suit. And they're like, yeah, man, that's going to become like, they can digitally replace that. He's like, he just totally didn't get it. He's like, no, man, like, I think you should show my face. Like, I'm, I'm a really good actor. <laughs> so mm. He wanted he to this... be the predator. No way. Yeah. So after like a day of this, they finally had to fire him because he was like <laughs> refusing to get in the suit and he thought the suit looked stupid. Like, he just didn't understand that it was going to become a digital thing. <laughs> That's like 30 years of drug use before, you know, when yeah. I was working with him. So, so he was, he holy was, shit. The, it was a green screen situation. He didn't understand that it was a green screen situation. Yeah. Well, no idea. Yeah. You run around in the suit kind of like Andy circus, uh, and all yeah. this shit. And, uh, God. Oh my God. That's brilliant. Hey, is it weird <laughs> now that you say it, that I actually would have preferred to have seen that movie. 
like yeah. Jean Claude Van Damme. It, 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 it kind of it kind of it kind of better. reminds me of those old like the '90s Saturday Night Lives where uh, Norm Macdonald's playing Burt Reynolds uh, auditioning for different parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's just like he won't get in character. He's just Burt Reynolds, but as that character. Yeah. So it'd be Jean Claude Van Damme's face, but the predator body. Oh, that'd be great. He's doing splits on two chairs. Like, dude, calm down, man. Look, this is not that movie. JCVD got the last laugh, man. He became Jean Claude Van Damme. Well, how, how is, mean, is he fucked up today? Like, is it, is it just madness? Yeah, there. I mean, there are actors who you give them the lines and they show up and they deliver on them set, and then there are actors who you have to schedule your day around. <laughs> and he, he's like definitely that. And he also like what his side gig right now is it, the way he makes his money, as far as I can tell, is he's some dictator decides he's having a birthday party and invites John Claude because he's his best friend or like Putin's having a birthday party. So like he invites John Claude and pays him an appearance fee. Yep. So we hire him for this movie and he insists that he has to have his own hairdresser. And you're like, dude, we got a whole hair and makeup. Like, what are you talking about? The yeah. quote hairdresser shows up and he's like this stocky Israeli guy, clearly like ex Mossad. And it's just a bodyguard and you never touches the guy's hair. And you're like, Oh, of course you, that's your quote, quote hairdresser because you got to bring that guy when you're going to go hang out with Putin. Yeah. Yeah, I, totally. look, yeah, we've dealt with a lot of those people where it's just like, and you do it because you have to and you don't have a choice, but it right. fu- it screws your whole day production-wise. Oh, man, it's a nightmare. Well, yeah. Nightmare. It's, like, it's hard enough to make anything without having to deal with that level, you know, with just shenanigans. What, was that why it only lasted as long as it did? The, the, the Amazon was just like, dude, we can't fucking do this anymore? I think it was a combination. You know, they had a huge turnover at the top. They had a bunch of people be would Um so that was mm. not particularly helpful. And I think they, you know, they were concerned about, you know, what sh- stories are going to emerge about John Claude potentially. I don't, there's a, yeah. it's a shame, but I, it's also that, that show is so weird and bonkers that I don't know that a future season, like the second or third season, what could, where could have gone? It was just kind of felt like a one-off when we were doing it. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, and what about Colony? I see you're, you're on here as an executive producer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, that was an amazing experience. I, you know, I never worked in television and went in the first season and uh, we shot for two years in L.A. and then the third year in Vancouver. And by the third year, I was, uh, you know, getting to run production, which was great. So, yeah, I mean, it's just really hard to make television for basic cable, when, especially a sci fi show when you're competing with, you know, these you're trying to make it on a budget of four million dollars and you're competing with sci fi shows that are spending 15 or 20. And like, you know, you just have to be really mindful of how you're going to make it seem cool and not cheesy because, you know, the audience now has expectations like it. You know, they want things to look really cool. Yeah, because like Josh Holloway was in this from Lost. Um, and, yeah. And the average budget for Lost itself was like $4 million an episode. Yeah. You know, and that was back in the day before they had all this crazy competition. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about the opposite, by the way. J- Josh Holloway, there's a, there's a prince. There's a guy who just like gets up and works. And to me, that's the most – it's just for crew morale if you're on a television show. Like mm-hmm. if you see like the lead actors showing up every day and like – you know, before call, working his ass off, having a good attitude, smiling at people like it does. You know, it seems like a small thing in this town because people are feel entitled to act like jackasses. But, you know, when you have someone like that, it just makes it so much easier to do anything. Uh, what else are you working on right now? Uh, writing a couple movies. Uh, and uh, can't really t- it's one of those weird things like people hire you and then they don't want you to talk about it. Um, no, I, you know, but, it's funny before we came on air, like that's what I, that's what I did for a long time. I usually ghost write a lot of movies because people don't understand. There's usually like 12, 13 writers on a movie, but only one or two get credit. Um, right. and then you have to sign an NDA and you can't fucking talk about it. So no one ever yeah. knows you go and take your friends and you're like, Oh, well, this scene made it, this scene made it, this scene made it. And then that's it. You have a laugh and then you leave. Um, <clears throat> but the money's great. Is that what, is that what, what you're talking about right now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's you, like you go home for Christmas and everyone's like, "What do you do?" You're like, "I write movies." Like, have I seen anything? You're like, "No." Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> like, well, you don't really write movies, then, do you? You're like, "Well, kind of." <laughs> well, Ross, you were one of the original writers on Brokeback Mountain, so it started out it was uh, a man and a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> they were like, "Hey, man, uh, why do you keep changing this pronoun to he?" Like, to well, he, just relax. Just relax. <laughs> It'll yeah. make sense later. When he sp- then, when he spits in his hand, you'll understand. You'll understand. That was uh, I was I wrote that that scene. Uh, no, I, I would <laughs> tell people like I w- at least tell my friends and be like, "Hey, I did this," and then you know. We would have a laugh about it, but uh, yeah, it's it's weird though when you when you get hired on this this shit and you can't tell anyone and you're just like, what do you do? And you're like, eh, you know, kind of this, yeah, um, yeah. right, yeah. Um, well, what, it's what, it's, it's, it's also it. like everything in te- so many. It used to be that things were shot. I live in Los Angeles. It used to be things were shot in Los Angeles, and now you know I got a young family and nothing shot here anymore. So yeah. 
you know, if you go to take a job on a TV show, you're looking, trying to explain like you're going to be gone for nine months out of the year. So, you know, it's a lot of like balancing that. Yeah. Look, everything's in Atlanta right now. Um, man, yeah. cause every yeah. year the, you know, the production report comes out of, uh, how many jobs have left LA to shoot and it just keeps getting higher and higher every single month. Yeah. The tax credit situation t- has totally changed it. You know, the only thing that's shoot here is sitcoms, like thing, you know, things that they can do and just exclusively on a stage. But if you want to make a the kind of show I want to make, like a cool action show, you can't you can't afford to shoot it here anymore, unfortunately. No, and a lot of them end up going to, to Vancouver or uh, uh, Toronto. Just you know, yep. it's cheaper up there to shoot. But uh, yeah, that's crazy, man. What's uh, what's your hopes and dreams? Is there a script that you're you're sitting on that hasn't been made yet that that you really want? <laughs> yeah, I got this. Uh, thing i wrote for it's a tv show for fx that's set in afghanistan that i've always you know i've always wanted to do i went there in uh, 2000 <clears throat> 2002 and it's been kind of like burned in my brain so and i feel like it's something that we're you know as americans we don't want to talk about and if you do something super serious people don't want to watch it because they don't want to confront it so the tone of it's like more kind of dark comedy to try to get people what you know, what to, were you doing in afghanistan in 2002 <laughs> I was trying, I wanted to be a novel. I, I started as a novelist and I wrote this book about baseball. And then I was like, well, well they love, they love it in Afghanistan. <laughs> oh yeah. They play it up in the goat mountains all the time. Uh, oh no, man. They love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and I was like, you know, you're, you're in your early twenties and you just think you're the king of the world. And I was like, I'm going to be like the next Hemingway and write this American abroad novel. And it's going to be about like this, you know, guy in Afghanistan when nine 11 happens. And I was like, well, if I'm going to write the book. I got to go over there. So I basically wrote a fake cover letter to get myself in the country and wandered around for two weeks, which was insanely stupid, but you know, also like life changing. Wow. That's, that's fucking crazy. What happened when, when, while you were over there? Like what does one do? Cause you were in Afghanistan, right? No. Uh, Iraq. Iraq yeah. Iraq. What, what does one do in Afghanistan when you're not military heroin? Uh, just showing <laughs> up. Is that true? That's the, the largest producer of heroin on earth. Oh yeah. It, why is it, is it, is it just fucking miserable there? No, because poppy grows there naturally. That's oh, why. really? Yeah. And there's, yeah. there are no laws. So instead of, um, like when the Taliban was in office, it kind of got shut down a little bit. Um, but now it's all run by tribal warlords. So they just, it's like whoever's the biggest drug dealer in that area runs the area. It's not really religious in gotcha. that way anymore. It's it's very bizarre. Did, what'd, you, what'd you do for those two weeks? Did you do heroin when you were over there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, which, which, where you're, so I went to uh, Herat, which is like this city on the border of Iran. And when we were, you know, when we were invading, we had cut all these deals with all these people who opposed the Taliban. So we just kind of handed them territory. So one of those guys we handed territory with is this guy, Ismail Khan. That's exactly what you're talking about. He was basically a drug runner. So you show up in this city and like it feels it's quote, 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 unquote safe because there's like a 13 year old in every corner of the Kalashnikov. But, you know, it, it, it's completely just drug money so he was running everything into western europe so he decided he wanted to have an air force so he bought himself two migs and parked them in the airport but he didn't have anyone could fly him it was just so like he could say that he had an air force but that's the amount of cash he was generating by you know collecting all these poppies and you know, just selling it into black tar and just sending it sending it towards europe holy shit so what, what was your book about then my book was going to be about like an american uh who was over there working as like one of those guys clearing mines under the taliban and mm-hmm. he's there when 9-11 happens and decides to stay in the country um, like an idiot. And then, you know, Oof. chaos ensues. Yeah, probably but, would have left. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably would have been smarter. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus. Is but this, just, I mean, it's a, did it come out? Get in that country. What's that? Did the book come no, out? No, I, I could never. That's the, that was the book that broke me that sent me down here as a screenwriter. Like, I could never get it right. I knew like what it wanted to be in my head, but I didn't have the experience or, like, the writing chops to be able to pull it off. So... You know, I had all these great stories from Afghanistan and like, yeah, I should have written a nonfiction book, like just the way to get into that country at the time was, as I said, like you had to, the only way to get in was to get a cover letter from, letter from a nonprofit. So I was playing soccer on a team with a woman who worked for a nonprofit. So I got her to write the letter. And then you had to, fl- the only commercial flight was Ariana Afghan Airlines, which was like two weeks old. And they were flying from, Tur- flying through Turkey. So you like show up in Istanbul at a mm. Turk airport at like midnight because they have the cheapest time slot except the plane isn't coming in because they hadn't paid their fuel bill in Germany. So the Germans weren't letting it take off. So like you go home, come back the next night, takes off, but it had to land in Tehran. 
And I guess we were, I was like the first American, I was there with a buddy of mine. I guess we were the first Americans to be on that flight since the Ariana started operating. So like they wouldn't let us pull in the terminal because they saw Americans on the manifest. So they, they had us on the runway and, you know, the Iranian guard like ran out and circled the plane. So I got this selfie like in the front door, like with, you know, revolutionary guard in the background. Anyway, it was this kind of dumb shit you do when you're in your 20s. Yeah, yeah. Man. I mean, I, I, when, I, when I was doing that sort of dumb shit, I actually had a gun. So yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. a bunch of other yeah. guys with guns as well. Because this, the, the the story you're describing is exactly what we tell the audience about these people, these Americans who get captured, and you're like, "What totally. the fuck were you doing over there?" Like that's yep. what we always say. You you actually did that. You were one of those dudes. We could have seen you in like one of those videos in an orange jumpsuit, getting your head chopped off. But for the grace of God, I mean, it, it was a weird time. It was, it was the brief moment of optimism in, in Afghanistan. It was like all these NGOs were flooding into Kabul. So Kabul at the time felt like this really international city because all this money was being poured in there. So, you know, and, you know, the Taliban had, quote unquote, been defeated. And, you know, the, it was just starting to pick up a little bit on the outskirts of Jalalabad. But, it, you know, it was, quote, it was it felt like a country that potentially would turn around. But when you got on the ground and you were in Kabul and you thought, oh, this is, you know, it's going to turn around. Then you go like 20 miles in any direction. You're like, Oh fuck. No. Like these people have been here for a thousand years. Nothing has changed. They're like this is, you could just kind of smell what was going to happen, but it was, you know, a year later it would have been suicidally stupid to go to the places I went. Yeah. In 2002, we mainly had guys uh, like agency operators and, and tier one operators over there, like climbing up on top of mountains and calling in the airstrikes and shit. We didn't have major right. ground force move and shit. Right. So you, wow. you can move about a little bit more freely, but still, I probably would have stayed out of there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now you're now you're in LA. You got a family. How many how many kids you got? Two girls, two daughters, which is great now. And the teenage years are looming. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 coming up. Um, yeah. yeah. What? How how is it raising kids in Los Angeles? That's, that's actually why I moved out of Los Angeles was to raise my kids somewhere else. Um, it, it's got to be tough now. It, it keeps getting harder, right? Private schools keep the, the price keeps going up. The, this is the problem for the industry here. Is like you know people ask me how to break in, and part of the problem is the cost of living here has gotten so absurd. Mm -hmm. So you know those years when you are struggling and like you're trying to find your first job, like I don't, I don't honestly don't know how some of these kids are supporting themselves. It's yeah, and then to raise a family on top of that is insane. Um, yeah. If I, you know, if I didn't have to be here, I would probably think about being somewhere else. But you know, it, it's still the heart of the industry, so you kind of have. to Of be. course, yeah, especially for a writer, because like, look, you're going on pitch meetings all the time. Uh, you know, all your yep. meetings are literally in LA, so there's no, there's nothing you can do. Just because it's shot somewhere else doesn't affect you as the writer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, all the decisions are made here still, and yeah. then you, you know you go, go and actually make stuff somewhere else. But yeah, you got to be here for that. Uh, well, shit. Well, Wes, hey, th thanks for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, tell everybody the exact day that it, it comes out on uh, Blu-ray and DVD midway. Um, man, why you got to put me on the spot like that? I think it's February 18th. February 18th. There we go. Um, <laughs> if if not, look, write Wes and uh, tell him he's a liar. <laughs> you know? Uh, um, <laughs> it is February 18th. He's right. Awesome. Right. Well, hey, man, we appreciate the time today. Uh, if you have not checked out Midway, get it on digital and DVD February 18th. Uh, it was a pleasure, man. Thanks, thanks for the time today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. And uh, thanks you to your audience also for showing up. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was hard to make a not superhero movie and, you know, those are the people who helped keep us in the theaters and hopefully they'll make more of these. So cool. thank, thanks to you and thanks to them. Yeah, man. For sure. Yeah. And look, and with the success of 1917, um, you know, yeah. Hollywood likes to, to keep reproducing the same thing. So I think there'll be at least a few more war movies made because of it. Cool guys. Cool. Thanks, thanks again. Thank yeah, you. Take care Wes. Yep. Bye, guys.